Amen. Amen. Okay, go ahead and turn with me as we start today. Matthew 25. We're going to read together the parable of the talents as we build into today's message, which is eyes of faithfulness. If you're titling your, titling your notes, it is eyes of faithfulness. This is enemies of productive faith, part 12. But um, eyes of faithfulness is what we want to move into today. Um, so Matthew 25, I'm going to read it from the message Bible. Did everybody um, that should have get sunglasses. Okay, perfect. Not everybody got them and we will explain why. Okay. And then at that point, um, we'll like cue that camera when I say it. Um, okay, perfect. Okay. We didn't, we didn't really practice this, but it's going to be great. Okay. Matthew 25 verse 14. <clears throat> it's also like a man going off on an extended trip. What is the kingdom? He called his servants together and he delegated responsibilities. Do y'all love, and is it your favorite thing ever that our church is built on personal responsibility? Yes. It's my favorite thing ever. I mean, there's so many great things. People, you know, the mantles that churches have been given, it's like, oh, that's so great. Um, but my favorite is ours, obviously. Um, just because it just puts the ball exactly where it is and the focus, you know, many great places they've focused on worship and that's so great. You know what I mean? And then like before long, in some cases, when you don't keep the main thing, the main thing, and I'm not saying everybody, but then it's like weird things start happening. It's like, what, what is actually going on? That's not worship. You know what, you know, you understand like, it's really important that what God puts a flashlight on or puts the spotlight on that we also put the spotlight on so that we stay in sync and in step because there's a lot of things that are great right? A lot of things that appeal to us in our, even in our flesh, you know, whether it's prosperity, financial prosperity, whether it's physical healing, all of those things are great, but ultimately all of those go back to your own personal responsibility. Are you going to, you know, uh, the love, you know, people who focus on that, you know, uh, you know, we had people leave our church years ago and, um, it didn't go well for them. Um, one of them, they're already, um, they're already with Jesus prematurely, in my opinion. I mean, they were maybe 20, 20, 25 years older than y'all, if that, but maybe not. <clears throat> they don't know who I'm talking about. Um, anyways, and so that didn't go well. It was the same ones that wanted me to have the kids really fast and get married to give my parents the grandchildren, if you remember that story from several weeks ago. Same ones. And so we had an incident in our old auditorium, and we had just rebuilt these platforms for our cameras, not the side cameras, because many of you guys were around for that. This was longer ago when we only had one new camera in the back, remember? And we had the platform, and it was like we were all excited we were celebrating it and like less than six months later some kids were running in the sanctuary and the camera fell and it broke and and you're just so grateful for everything that God's allowed you to move into and to have and so we were like obviously crushed um not crushed but like oh well that that wasn't ideal like we we <clears throat> struck down but not destroyed <laughs> good use of scripture and um so we're like when you have some rules like let's not run in a sanctuary you know what I mean well this couple felt like we were too uptight in that that we would create that that rule and so um anyway they left and um and he's not in a good place he's in a he's in a home and um and then she's already at her ultimate home and so you know you know we just weren't loving enough and that wasn't the truth that wasn't the truth at all. We very much love people. We love kids. And there's a place to run. There's an absolute place to run. If you've been with us any length of time, we ran a lot in that building with the lights off and concussed each other. So we're not against love or fun, but just when the cameras aren't set up already, you know, when we're not already ready for the service, I mean, we can turn it into a full on gymnasium, you know, and we did. And you guys, have the boxing, the whole thing we've done in there, in the old building. But anyway, <clears throat> personal responsibility 
really, um, that, that's where we are. That's who we are. We can't separate who we are, what we're called to do without that. So he called his servants. He delegated responsibilities to one. He gave 5,000 to another two to a third, uh, 1,000, depending on their ability. So everybody doesn't have the same ability. Then he left right off. The first servant went to work, doubled his master's investment. The second did the same, but the man with the single thousand dug a hole, carefully buried his master's money. After a long absence, the master of those three servants came back, settled up with them. The one given five, $5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment. His master commended him saying, good work. You did your job well. From now on, you'll be my partner. The servant with 2,000 showed him also how he had doubled his master's investment and his master commended him, good work. You did your job well. From now on, you will be my partner. Do you realize that how you live now places you in eternity? Yeah. Yeah. And that's forever. Yes. That's forever. Yeah. How you steward what you have now places you in eternity. I love that Reverend Joe Morris says, I know we have this religious idea that we're all going to go up there and shoot harps and, or play harps and shoot bow and arrows and like eat chocolate fondue on a cloud. It's not going to happen. We're going to be ruling and reigning with him. When there's a new heaven and there's a new earth, there's going to be rulers. There's going to be leadership. There's how you handle things now places you in eternity. He said to the third master, I know, or the, the third said to master, I know you have high standards and you hate careless ways that you demand the best and make no allowances for error. I was afraid that I might disappoint you. So I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is safe and sound down to the last cent. The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers where at least I would have gotten a little interest. Take the thousand and give it to the one who risked the most and get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb, throw him out into utter darkness. So write this down and we began to unpack it a couple weeks ago. Place doesn't define level of life, but level of responsibility. So we see here that everybody didn't get the same, but that doesn't mean that everybody didn't get the same covenant. That just means that everybody doesn't have the same responsibilities. And God knows what you are capable of. So there's no comparison. There's no need to envy what someone else has. If you're going to be faithful, you focus on the fact that in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. What does that mean? It doesn't mean, it, it, what it means is it doesn't matter if you are the owner or if you work for the owner. Your covenant and your prosperity is not tied to that position. Your covenant and your prosperity is tied to your position in him. But you have varying responsibilities. We all have varying responsibilities and we're going to be held responsible. And, and our, um, I think I put it this way in my notes and you can write it this way. Your supply is in grace, not your place. So it's by the grace of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that we've been saved. So that means it doesn't matter what color of skin I am. It doesn't matter what I'm called to do. If everyone is the CEO, then who's going to do the work? Right? So, so we can't look at what we've been called to do and what we're gifted to do the way that the world does, where it minimizes these places and, and, and you're ingrained in you from a young age that if you're this, that you're not as valuable as a doctor or whatever, fill it in. That's not true according to God's word. We're to do what he's called us to do, what we're made to do. But write it this way, to grow in grace, you have to be faithful. You can grow in the place and in the position that you have. And that place is very much valuable and it's very much worthwhile. Now, in a perfect world, you would be treated that way. You know, for example, in, um, in the textile department of the Walt Disney World Company, where they do, um, and I don't have the, the stats memorized, but I mean, countless thousands of pieces of textiles every single day, whether it's napkins all the way to towels and sheets and linens. Um, you know, they were entrusted with their supervisor's permission to be very hands-on in their deadlines, in their, um, how many, uh, pieces they, they uh, are set a goal to accomplish every single day. And so they're not looked upon as less than than somebody in a higher ranking position. And so they've made a lot of changes. They've, they've been, so it's not this, they're less than. 
um, the housekeeping, um, they, had, they had started at, uh, at a management level to decide, okay, we need to cut some costs in different places. So they removed the sewing kits from each of the hotel rooms because it's like no one really misses the sewing kits. Well, they hadn't consulted with the housekeeping. And the housekeeping's like, they do take the sewing kits. Like the sewing kits is a big thing, not necessarily just because of the sewing kit, but because the tin that you put it in. It's a collectible item and the guests really, really like that. And so as quickly as the sewing kits were removed, they were put right back in there, right? And so this is a company that is very, very successful. Um, regardless of what you think about them, listen, the fact that we even have to use these examples because the church is so pathetic and so casual is not my favorite. Please don't think that I'm endearing myself to that organization that we would even have to use their name in the same context as these sacred holy scriptures. But the fact is, as long as the church continues to be complacent, just like Jesus used natural examples in the parable of, or the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, that's what I have to work with. So, um, that's that's the that's the facts okay so so as quickly as the sewing kits were removed they were put right back why because that position those people that are keeping the room, so to speak, are just as valuable, if not more valuable, as the CEOs that are crunching numbers. So if you see yourself wrong and you see yourself as less than, that's your problem. Yeah. And, and even if people have said things about you, you choose what words you accept. You choose what you hold on to. You can, though, <clears throat> in your place, just like they did, grow and become more proficient, but that's gonna require faithfulness. And clearly, that's what the two out of the three servants did. They grew what they had. The problem is when you're not growing, when things aren't multiplying underneath you, when things aren't flourishing underneath you. And honestly, when they're not, it creates a cycle of death, so to speak. And guys, when there's no growth, you give the enemy place. You can find, we've seen it in different departments at church, when you know the leader, <clears throat> excuse me, isn't being faithful, you know that there's probably carnality present, casualness present, and it affects <clears throat> everybody that you're attached to. Yeah. So the eyes of faithfulness, and I, I wrote it this way in my notes, and let's begin to unpack it this way. <clears throat> you can't be faithful in life without being faithful in your perspective. So let's start in Hebrews 12. You can't be faithful in life without being faithful in your perspective. Hebrews 12, verse one. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on. It means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins, Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you're going to be faithful in your life, you have to be faithful in your eyes. You have to keep your perspective right. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished the race that we're in. Study. This is the message. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in with God he, excuse me, finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever, and now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again. Item by item, that long latency of hostility he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Now, why is it so important that we keep our eyes on Jesus? Well, Hebrews 13, eight says, for Jesus doesn't change. If there's going to be consistency in your life, there has to be consistency in your eyes. And the enemy is the master of distraction. 
And for each and every one of us, distractions look a certain way. So growing up driving with Pastors Dean and Kathy, you know, on vacations and different things, especially in the big city, Pastor Dean is the master of distracted driver. Absolutely. Like, especially, now certain things get his attention more than others. Like, he can spot a mall. Like, he's like, is that, is that Dillard's over there? You know what I mean? Like, the problem is, is he's driving. You know what I mean? Like, he's driving. He's like, you know, if it's Papacitos, like, is that a Papacitos up there? You know, he's like distracted. You know, Pastor Greg, his eyes would deviate to a different thing. You know, they're both kind of, when, if there's a dealership, you know, like, oh, there's a, you know, whatever dealership or there's a huge, you know, whatever. So, so it could be different things. Pastor Kathy does not look to the left or to the right. I just want to tell you. And if you're driving with her in the car and you do look to the left or the right, she will be sure and tell you to pay attention, pay attention to the road, pay attention to the road, you know, uh, because she is very much like if you ever see her driving in town and she doesn't wave at you, she's not veering to the right or to the left. Um, and you know, Pastor Faith is more distracted with people. Like she watches people in the cars right now next written next to her and makes jokes and tries to make faces and you know get their attention and stuff so she's more motivated by people y'all typically um, I'm, I'm not I'm, if I'm not driving I'm out like I'm out like I'm listening to a message or I'm, I'm, I'm on my phone like I'm not really but but the reality is we're all distracted potentially in different ways and you have to be responsible for for your perspective they they distracted me you know at school they were bugging me you know I remember in kindergarten I had a really really sanguine friend she went home to be with the Lord um, in seventh grade we had just finished our our seventh grade year we were both little redheads but she had the total opposite personality than me she was the baby she was the talker so we're in kindergarten and she was I mean she just thought everything was a group project like any homework any uh, task we were given we were to work on it together and I love her so much I mean deeply loved her um, and and so I would help her well it was only a matter of time that we got the screens the most demoralizing thing ever when you get those boxes that protect you for and I'm a I'm a firstborn like this is a bad thing like I'm in trouble you know I'm already in kindergarten and I'm only in kindergarten and I've already got the thing but Courtney would not shut up she would and and, and honestly as as sad as it was to me I knew it was her fault so I made peace with it Otherwise, I would have been traumatized for the rest of my life. But I knew this is her fault. Like, Courtney never shuts up. And her mom was the exact same way. And so she came by, honestly, she was to, her mom was to my mom what she was to me. And, and so she was a distraction, right? But I can't blame her. Like, I still had to choose to focus. And so it doesn't matter what hand you've been dealt and what potential roadblocks the enemies put your way. That's why I love the message of personal responsibility so much. Whatever it is, I can overcome it. And today's a new day. His mercies are new every morning. This is a new week. If it all fell apart last week, I can't do anything about that except repent and start fresh this week, right? And so Jesus doesn't change. He's the same. So faithful eyes, number one, are on him, not them. It's so important that you don't compare your race to somebody else's race because your race is different. You know, even as a young person, you know, so-and-so's, you know, they're already married, they already have kids. Well, that's great for so-and-so. Yay for so-and-so. Let's go to the wedding, get them a gift, buy them a baby shower present, whatever. Yay for them. But that, what does that have to do with you? Right. right, and you've got this timetable and you've got these expectations of what other people want from you. Well, they have this degree or they have this gift or they're doing this with their life. Maybe I should be doing that with my life. Nothing wrong with not inventing the wheel. Yeah. If somebody else is doing something and it's successful and it bears witness with me, I'm absolutely gonna do it. Yeah. I'm not gonna get in the kitchen and try to make up my own recipe with kitchen stuff. I'm just gonna use what somebody else has already said. Do you know what I'm saying? Like in life, the same thing. There are certain things that, yeah, absolutely. If they've got a system that works, why would I waste time trying to make my own system just for the purpose of being unique? That's a system that bears witness with me. I can implement that right away, where it's, whether it's with my kids or it's a system with my marriage or whatever, an organization, whatever. I'm doing it, absolutely. But that can be done without this feeling of uh, inferiority or, or not, not as good as someone else. And John 
John 21, uh, remember this conversation that Jesus had with Peter right after his restoration um, and his launch back into the ministry after he had allowed shame to take him away. In verse 20 of John 21, turning his head, Peter noticed the disciple Jesus loved following right behind. Who is that? That's John. When Peter noticed him, he asked Jesus, Master, what's going to happen to him? Jesus said, if I want him to live until I come again, what's that to you? Guys, that's how Jesus answers every thought in your head about what's going on with so-and-so. You know what Jesus' response is always going to be to that? What's that to you? What's that to you? Well, I just don't understand why people, why they did what they did. Because that's what they wanted to do. You do what you want to do, don't you? I do what I want to do. People do what they want to do. Well, I don't understand why they did, why they wanted to do that. Because your desires follow your disciplines. And if you're not disciplined in the word and in the spirit, then your desires will not be spiritual. So it's not like, oh my gosh, I just don't understand. And you waste all this time talking. You know, I remember being in sixth grade and I had a group of three. There was a group of three. Well, one of them peeled off and she started smoking weed in sixth grade. And me and the other girl, we were walkers at recess, just walkers, just walk and talk, eat your snack, you know, whatever. And I remember me and my other friend, the one that didn't smoke weed, she didn't peel herself off. We were just, we would just walk and talk and be like, everything's changed now. What do we do? Like we tried to help her. We tried to tell her not to do it. You know, we walked and talked about that situation for probably an entire semester. Honestly, we just, we just couldn't believe it. How could she do this? Like we were all so close. We were good girls, you know, I mean, Catholic, Luther, I mean, how good can you, anyway, Catholic, Catholic smoked the weed, not, not saying anything, but you know what I mean? And then the Lutheran, it, it's fine. And so we're just the good girls. And it was like, you know, we just walk, what, how, we can't believe that this, what good is that? She did that because that's what she wanted to do in that moment. That's what she wanted to do, whether she wanted to be accepted. People do what they do because they want to do. Well, something must have, something must have happened. Yeah, they got up and decided what to do, just like you got up today and decided what you're going to do. One of, one of my favorite things that Pastor Charles said over the years, as he's talking to us, just even as leaders, and he wasn't talking to us, but um, he might have been, but, but basically, you can do everything right, preach the word, be instant, honor God, but at the end of the day, people are still going to do whatever they want to do, right? Aren't you going to do whatever you want to do? So are other people. So what's it to you? Your eyes have to be on him, not on them. Now, me and my friend had no desire, and that didn't tempt us at all to smoke weed, but it was an absolute waste of our time. It was an absolute distraction to focus our energies on what somebody else was doing. Number two, faithful eyes are on him, not on circumstances. Literally, you have to filter everything through what would Jesus do? Second Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith and not by sight. So I'm not moved by the circumstances. Acts 20, 24, Paul said, none of these things move me. None of them move me. I'm immovable. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul said, be steadfast, be immovable. If he said to be immovable, then I can be immovable. Right. And the reality is, and I think I wrote it in my notes this way. If you don't see right, you won't say right or do right. right. And there's your, your faith is shot. Because yeah. your faith is believing, speaking, and doing the word of God. Yeah. So that's how you can tell if something's moving you if you keep talking about it. I'm not saying there's not a conversation to be had, but then you stop talking about it. You give it a voice, you give it a place. So then ultimately, faith becomes all about what you're looking at, right? <clears throat> faith had a student in the, in the toddler room years and years ago, and she was correcting him. And he was like, what you looking at with those big blue eyes? Isn't that what he said? Yeah. What you looking at with those big old eyes? Cause she was like in his face, like loving him. And she does have big eyes. But I just thought how perceptive of that little kid <laughs> to realize that, you know what I mean? Of all the things that he could say in that moment, you know, he's very, he's a detailed person. Uh, hopefully he's in a detail world right now. Cause he's got skills. What are you looking at with those big, big, big eyes? Big old eyes, whatever. So the whole reality is your faith is all about what you looking at. What you looking at? 
right? So faith is on, faith, faithful eyes are on him, not on circumstances. Number three, faithful eyes are on the day, not the future. Yeah. Not the future. Yeah. Faithful eyes are on the day. Guys, this is the day that you have to be faithful, not tomorrow. Right. Today. Matthew 6.33, live one day at a time. What about, and just write down the reference, we won't look it up, you guys are familiar with it. In Mark 10, 35 through 45, when James and John's mother came to Jesus, talking about their future. You know, we felt that pressure before. If my kids do this internship, what's that gonna do for their future? What, you want me to poop out a piece of paper that gives them some sort of accreditation? You know what I mean? Get out of my face with your kid's future. We're just trying to make sure they make it through the next two days, honestly. It's good. Do you know what I mean? Like, but James and John's mother's like, now listen, can you imagine this conversation? But this happens all the time. If my kid really goes all the way and they don't get a degree and they don't go to college, you know what I'm saying? Listen, Jesus, are you gonna guarantee that my two sons are gonna have a position? And Jesus is like, yeah, bro, we're just trying to get them to be able to walk by faith like today as I'm standing right here after all the miracles that they've seen for that to be big enough inside of them yeah. to actually sustain them but she's so concerned about their future yeah. guys if you're so concerned about your kids future then be a good parent today yeah, that's right. Right. That's and then tomorrow do the same thing yeah. know what they're thinking know what they're eating know who they're hanging out with know what they're listening to you're trying to set them apart and set them up for a future that's basically rooted in a selfless, godless system, and then you, you're concerned about it, exempting yourself from your responsibilities as a parent, and instead just praying that it all works out and sending them to church, that doesn't work. If you wanna guarantee their future, then be very faithful today. And then tomorrow, do the same thing. Well, what are you gonna do about your future? You know, you've really gotta do this. No, today, what do they have to do? What are the things that are important today? Their room needs to be where it's supposed to be. They're eating what they're supposed to be eating. They're, they're, is the homework done? Do it today. Do it today. And then as it pertains to us as adults, we've seen all these parents uh, make all these plans. We're gonna do this. In seven years, we're gonna retire. And then, you know, they do. They retire their body and they end up in glory. Right, they make all these plans of how they feel like life's gonna look. James 4, 13 through 16. And now I have a word for you who brashly announce, today at the latest, tomorrow we're off to do this and this. Uh, we're gonna start a business. We're gonna make a lot of money. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. You're nothing but a wisp of fog. Your life is a vapor, the King James says, catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Instead, make a habit to say, if the master wills. That prayer of consecration every single day and just be led of the Holy Ghost. Well, we need to plan, we need to prepare. You, you're already preparing, the, it's not even, people are already planning Christmas. Texting me, do you guys know what the calendar is? Uh, as soon as we know, we typically announce it. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And if that's not enough notice, I apologize. Plan the family vacation, do whatever you gotta do, we miss you. But I'm not gonna get on your timetable. I'm not gonna get on your timetable. I'm taking it one day at a time. That's right. If I haven't got there yet, we haven't got there yet. And if you need an annual plan, a year's plan, you know, I was a part of a church that did that. That's great. But I, I'm not gonna exempt the Holy Ghost and fire and new opportunities happening and showing up that may not fall within, you know, we always do this. And we, sometimes we always do stuff and it's like, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. I'm over that. That's not producing any fruit. Yeah. And there's a bunch of people losing sleep for no reason for that. We're not doing that anymore. Well, we always did that. Yeah, we did. We always did. Look at a picture. It's great. Great. We're not doing that anymore. You know what I mean? Well, we need a lot of notice. You know what? When you flow with him, like he makes a way and works things out for you. And you don't have to be concerned about all that. Well, we're going to get the, we, we have to book these flights right now. We're going to get a good deal. And so, so now we're poor. You understand what that's rooted in? That's rooted in fear. That's rooted in poverty. Well, I need a plan. I need to save up, right? Because you're not gonna have enough. What's that rooted in? That's rooted in fear. So all that, well, we just need to be responsible. Listen, you have so many, uh, you have so much attention and energy of your life, not on this season, that you're absolutely blowing this season. You're so concerned about how your 
student or, or how your company's gonna look three years from now, that you're not even doing what needs to be done today. Lastly, faithful eyes are full of faith. When you leave today, you'll receive one of these if you don't already have one, John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance. This is the amplified, to the full until it overflows, which means you filter everything through, there's more. Put this somewhere where you can see it. Your job, your family, your marriage, there's more. There's more. As great as it, is, as it is, there's more. As great as my ministry department is, there's more. You filter everything through, there's more. This keeps your focus on faithfulness. Yeah. Because in that faithfulness, you've put a demand on what God has called you to do and on his ability to anoint it and increase it. Otherwise, you get comfortable, you get complacent, you get excited about the progress you've already made. Big deal. It's a new day. So the reality is, um, and go ahead and put your sunglasses on if you have them. Only two thirds of those servants were found faithful. So if you don't have a pair of sunglasses, if you did not receive one when you came in, please stand. Now, if you put your eyes on people, you could be potentially discouraged because in a room this size, this many people aren't gonna be faithful. Because one out of the three servants did not use responsibility. So if you put your eyes on people, you're gonna have a lot of reason to be complacent. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna have a lot of reason to maybe be discouraged or distracted. Now you guys sit down and those of you that have glasses on stand up, you look different and it's not like it's always sunny and that's another thing. Okay, that's another thing for people who wear sunglasses for an extended period of time indoors. That's, that's another thing. But obviously you've set yourself apart and you don't look like the people that don't have them on. And in many cases that intimidates people. That intimidates you out of keeping the glasses on because your family isn't living that way. Right? And so you have to decide a faithful life distinguishes me. I don't think like everybody else. I don't see circumstances like everybody else because faithfulness starts in the way that you look at life and the way that you look at life eventually becomes the way that you talk about your life and then it becomes how you live your life, which ultimately at the end of the day is faith, which is what we're called to live to. So eyes on people, sobering reality that we're not all crushing this. So you decide what kind of person you're gonna be. And I believe that you're gonna choose life. You're gonna to choose to be this kind of person, but, but that's gonna require of you. That's not automatic. That's not something that can be prayed into you. It's not even something that can be taught into you. Right. You have to be open. You have to receive it. You have to accept the call and say, I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for, for this.